Hey, this is Warren Redlick. There's a lot of gold in Tesla's impact report. They released their latest impact report yesterday. I went through, I picked out some nuggets that I think are really important for understanding the future of Tesla's business. Are you ready? Let's go. The report's about 90 pages long. There's a lot of nuggets in there, a lot of tidbits that are interesting. What you can see down here below is they indicated that Gigafactory Berlin and Gigafactory Texas are still slated to open in late 2021. That's great news. We're excited about Giga Berlin and Giga Texas. One other rumor I heard is they expect to start production of Giga Texas Model Y in October. Not from this report. I've just heard that from other sources that the production of Model Y in Texas could start as early as October. Not deliveries, production would start in October. That could mean we'd see meaningful deliveries of Model Y from Giga Texas by the end of 2021, and hopefully meaningful delivery of Giga Berlin Model Ys by the end of 2021. Keep in mind, this is in the context that Semi, Cybertruck, and other projects have been pushed back to 2022. Model Y appears to be the priority. They are working to get those factories going. The demand for Model Y is off the charts. So in the short term, we can expect that Tesla will be growing very fast in terms of producing and selling Model Y vehicles to a market that demands them hugely. Another detail here, Tesla reiterates their goal in 2030 to sell 20 million electric vehicles per year. I think they're sandbagging. I think they're gonna produce more, produce and sell more than 20 million electric vehicles in 2030. I think they may get to 18 million vehicles in 2026, we'll see. They also talk about deploying 1.5 terawatt hours, 1500 gigawatt hours of energy storage a year in 2030. Again, I think that's a low number compared to the goals they've stated before. This adds up to in the ballpark of the three terawatt hours of batteries they said they'd make in 2030. If they make three terawatt hours of batteries in 2030 and they're still getting batteries from suppliers in 2030, they should be producing more than this in terms of vehicles and energy storage. I'm not sure how they get there, what the theory is, and there's a little bit more about this coming next. You can see on this page, Tesla was talking about the fact that they sold three gigawatt hours of energy storage products in 2020. They said that on the previous page, and that was 25% of the 12 gigawatt hour global market. They estimate that global annual battery storage production will need to increase to 10,000 gigawatt hours or 10 terawatt hours in 2030. I believe they're aiming for 2030 and they would only be producing 1.5 of those terawatt hours. These sound like the same goals they talked about at Battery Day. 10 terawatt hours for energy storage and 10 terawatt hours for transportation. They also talk about Megapack below me here. This sort of generally the idea of Megapack is that if it makes sense for business owners, they will buy it and they will install it. There's no reason not to install one if it makes economic sense to do so. He mentioned that a single mega pack has on average 3000 kilowatt hours, which is three megawatt hours of battery storage capacity. There are different types of mega pack. It's scalable to doing projects of over one gigawatt hour. Really cool. At the very bottom of this, they say that the global demand for energy storage products in 2020 continue to be far above the available global supply. They are growing as fast as they can to produce as much energy storage as they can. Unfortunately, they need the battery cells for vehicles first, but they're getting the battery supplies are ramping up and we should expect energy storage to ramp up soon. Now, this to me is one of the more interesting tidbits. They talk about how the standard range plus Model Y achieves an EPA range of 5.1 miles per kilowatt hour. And they talk about how there's a balance between performance and energy efficiency. And then below you see they talk about Tesla robo taxis will be even more energy efficient. This is the 2023 vehicle that we're waiting to hear more about. And this is a reasonably big hint about what's coming. The energy efficiency of Tesla vehicles will continue to improve as we continue to improve our technology. Reasonable to assume our high mileage products, such as our future Tesla robo taxis, will be designed for maximum energy efficiency as handling acceleration and top speed become less relevant. You don't need high performance if you are a passenger. High performance is fun for the driver. It's not fun for the passenger. For those who follow me closely, you know I'm talking about building a single passenger EV and it is all about efficiency. It is all about low cost and acceleration and handling and top speed are way down the list of important characteristics for that application. And you, your goal is to minimize the cost for customers, the cost per mile, the cost to build the vehicle, the, the cost of the energy to run it. This is all what matters. And big hint here, 
They're still planning future Tesla Robo Taxi. This is the 2023 vehicle mentioned at Battery Day. They're working on it. It's coming. More on vehicle efficiency and particularly range and battery life here. This suggests, if you read this page, this suggests that the 2023 vehicle will have a 250 mile range. Why do we get that? They say creating a battery that could last for a million, a million miles, parentheses, 4,000 charging cycles, would be better than a battery that only lasts 200,000 miles or 150,000 miles. They talk about above that. Well, 4,000 charging cycles would make sense to reach a million miles with a 250 mile range. Elon has talked about a minimum of 300 miles of range for a consumer owned vehicle, but for a robo taxi application, I believe in my own calculations that 250 miles of range is plenty and even 200 miles of range might be enough. With lithium iron phosphate batteries, this should be easy to attain the 4,000 charging cycles. I think this is where we're heading. They said that the 2023 battery day vehicle would be using iron phosphate cells. They typically achieve 10,000 charging cycles, so this should be straightforward. It may be he's also thinking about Tesla's 4680s for some future robo-taxi that would achieve 4,000 charging cycles, and they would not have to use that many battery cells to achieve 250 miles of range. That's another theory, I'm not sure. And again, towards the bottom, they say a single future Tesla vehicle with a million mile battery could be utilized over five times more than an average vehicle. Okay. So the single future Tesla vehicle, the, the future of Tesla vehicle, the 2023 battery day vehicle will have a million mile battery. It sounds like they're aiming for 4,000 cycles. I'm really unclear here whether they're going for the nickel based cell or the iron phosphate cell. They said the iron phosphate cell before. Iron phosphate makes sense to me because it's lower cost and they should be able to achieve 4,000 charging cycles easily with iron phosphate cells in this vehicle. So that's what's coming. Very exciting to see that the 2023 battery day vehicle is still on their roadmap. It's still coming. Get ready. There was a little bit about Tesla Semi here. Now, Tesla Semi was pushed back to 2022, but it's still in the plans. Talked about how important semis are, that they're 17% of all U.S. vehicle emissions, even though they're not that many of the vehicles. They drive a lot and they use a lot of energy and they emit a lot of CO2 and other pollutants. So they're about 17% of all U.S. vehicle emissions. So getting semis over to electric is important for the mission. They say when fully loaded, the Tesla semi should be able to achieve over 500 miles of range because of aerodynamics and highly efficient motors. And this truck will be able to reach an efficiency of over 0.5 miles per kilowatt hour. This is important. If we go back to the other slide, they talked about the standard range plus Model 3 achieving 5.1 miles per kilowatt hour. The Model Y all-wheel drive version is about 4 miles per kilowatt hour. Some of the other EVs on the market are closer to 3 miles a kilowatt hour. Getting a Tesla Semi carrying 80,000 pounds total, 80,000 pounds including the vehicle, to be able to do half a mile per kilowatt hour is very, very efficient in terms of the, the cost of transporting a kilogram a mile. The cost per kilogram mile ends up being very, very efficient in energy and cost if you're able to achieve half a mile per kilowatt hour. Just, you know, keep in mind that the standard range Model 3 weighs like 4,000 pounds. This is 80,000 pounds. You're moving 20 times the mass with 10 times the energy. So it's a very, very efficient application on the cost of cargo delivering cargo. Very, very interesting. Very, very exciting that we're going down this path. Semi is coming. Semi will be extremely efficient within the space that it operates. There was important information in the impact report about batteries. And one thing that stood out to me was they talked about purchased cobalt materials. And at the bottom, you can see Fremont in-house cell production is using cobalt. This was a surprise. At battery day, they said that the 4680 high nickel cell would not use cobalt and that there would be an intermediate cell called a nickel manganese cell that would not use cobalt. It appears at least for now that Fremont's 4680 cell production and presumably the 4680s that we produced at Berlin and Texas, at least the early ones, will use cobalt. This was a surprise. This is not what they said before. A little bit more about that next. Because cobalt has such a, a negative perception in the world about how cobalt is is brought out of mining that there's all kinds of issues in the Democratic Republic of Congo, political human rights issues that are related. The impact report talks a lot about cobalt. And what we find out here is number one, Tesla's batteries use less cobalt for the amount of kilowatt hours they have. 
and they are working on a diversified cathode strategy for lithium iron phosphate or iron-based cells and nickel-based cathodes with varying cobalt contents. The iron-based cells, I think, generally have zero cobalt, so that's a really important detail to note. They're working to eliminate cobalt from their cathode in the long term. In the short term, it will continue to be important material, and they expect absolute cobalt demand to increase over the coming years because even though they're reducing the amount of cobalt per cell, they're radically increasing the number of cells that they produce. So overall, they're using more cobalt and they're trying to be careful or they are being careful to make sure that they're sourcing their cobalt in responsible ways. This is also interesting because Elon talked recently about how he's concerned that they have too many different kinds of cell chemistries and cell formats. He called it the Ben and Jerry's of battery cells. And he wants to reduce to 4680 cylindrical format, one other format, one or two nickel-based chemistries and iron phosphate chemistry and get it down to two or three chemistries and in total two or three chemistry formats. So maybe 4680 nickel-based cells and iron phosphate. I don't know if that's going to be a cylindrical cell or continue with prismatic. That that's the medium term or long term goal is to get there. But in the short term, we are stuck with using cobalt in nickel-based cells in substantial volume. And there's a little bit more about that. One of the goals that Tesla has in producing 4680 cells is transitioning to in-house cathode material manufacturing. So we heard in their recent investor call that they're having trouble with certain aspects of 4680 production, just speeding it up and there's some kind of problem with a roller and that it's an engineering problem, they'll get it. But specifically on this line, they say, while transitioning to in-house cathode materials should take longer than transitioning to in-house cells, the cathode materials manufacturing process could reduce energy use. So they're not yet making their own in-house cathode materials. I think the in-house cathode materials they're going to be making will be nickel-based cells without cobalt. It may be nickel-manganese cells, it might be high nickel cells, unclear, but currently they're using cathode materials from someone else in the manufacturing of 4680 cells. This is something we did not know before. My understanding was that the whole process of 4680 was all in-house. Now we learn that's not completely accurate. There's a nice little bit here about factory efficiency. If you look at the image on the left, you can see that's how manufacturing works at the Fremont factory. The image on the right is the Shanghai factory. And you can see it's a much smoother line and that makes manufacturing a lot more efficient. There's a really interesting detail that I never thought of here. I kind of noticed this detail, but I never understood why. When you look at an image of a new Tesla factory, you see all these doors for semis, for big trucks to back up to unload or load materials. And this is why the way they design the factories, a delivery truck can back up and offload components at the exact part of the production line where the components are needed. So rather than having all the materials come into one spot in the building and be transported inside the building, they've designed the factory so the trucks can back up to whatever spot in the factory that that stuff is needed and that makes the factory run more efficiently. Really, really brilliant. And here, this is another little hint at the future. We build each new factory to be better and more sustainably designed than the previous one. There's substantial improvements at Giga Shanghai, and there's further improvements happening at Giga Berlin and Giga Texas. And we know the next generation Giga factory is coming for the 2023 Battery Day vehicle. There will be even more efficiencies in that factory. We're going to find out more about that, I hope, in mid-2022. Those factories should be start, they should start building those factories in 2022 or 2023. And that's going to be even more factory efficiency, which for the purposes of this report, they're minimizing the environmental impact while producing vehicles that help the environment. Electric vehicles help the environment. Last little detail here is some information about Tesla's water usage at their factories. There's this whole process of cooling equipment that uses a lot of energy and uses a lot of water and they think they can offset that by using rainwater or wastewater, that, that that's a better way. It uses less water, which is better in, in a whole bunch of ways. It's better for the environment overall. It's better for costs of running your factory. So Giga Berlin will use hybrid cooling towers. You can see at the middle, they're gonna eliminate quench tanks and casting. When you do a casting, they typically have to soak the casting in cool water, and that's no longer necessary in the casting process. So that's important. And then they're using cascade rinsing systems in the paint shop and battery can wash process. I don't know what a cascade rinsing system is. I think it's a system that probably uses water efficiency or efficiently or uses the same water over and over again. They're doing things to make 
usage of water more efficient. And then the last thing at the bottom, they're planning to capture at least 25% of roof runoff to a central underground storage system within Giga Texas. So they're going to be storing water. They're going to have some, I guess, huge amount of water storage underneath Giga Texas. I haven't seen where that's going to be, but that's another interesting detail. And that's a huge amount of water that can be used. And it's going to save 7.5 million gallons of potable city water. Instead of using water from the city of Austin, they will reduce the amount of water they use from the city of Austin by using rainwater. Huge roof, 1 million square feet. It's a lot of rain falling on it when it rains. If they can capture that water and use it, that's really important for the environment and for lowering Tesla's costs as well. So that's what I saw in the impact report. You can also check out Dr. know it -all's channel. He just did a video on his take on the impact report. He talked about some other topics. He was more focused on the environment. I was more focused on the business of what's going on with Tesla. Of course, if you like this channel, please check out my other videos. Please support this channel on Patreon. Thanks to the Vasa Law Firm in Sweden and all my Patreon supporters for helping this channel grow. Check out elonbits.com for merch like the machine that builds the machine and the stainless steel water bottle. And thank you so much for watching.